author, curator, and co-founder of The Creative Independent, Brandon Stosoy, and I kick off Conversation 65, chatting about our affection for Greenpoint, Brooklyn, the city in which I used to reside within an actual warehouse above a metal shop. Flowing past my memories of the harsh metal shards going into my lungs, I ask if film nor cinema is still around, a seemingly drab-looking facade until you enter and realize the internal space is used for screening offbeat films. Transitioning into the drastic gentrification of the neighborhood, we then dive deep into his humble beginnings growing up in rural America, creating zines by hand, putting on his first music festival, his current publications, culture, and future projects in the works and of course, lots more. So please enjoy this wonderfully creative and engaging conversation, RL. And of course, music by Walter ETC, video produced by artist Kevin Gilmore. Uh, Brandon, uh, thank you for uh, uncontaminated, uh, joining me on Uncontaminated Sound and taking the time to converse art and sure. culture with me and music. And, um, so, like you were saying, you were in Greenpoint. I was going to just say, like, my journey, I just picked up from Boston on a whim in late 2016, moved to Brooklyn in a windowless room in Crown Heights. Then I went to Greenpoint in an actual warehouse. Mm -hmm. and, and then I've kind of found myself right now in Beacon, New York. So it's like, yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned Greenpoint just right off before I hit record. So it's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I haven't had my luck in housing <laughs> in Brooklyn, but I love Brooklyn to heart. I, it feels more like home compared to the beacon myself, but um, I've been here for a while now, you know, like I, I've, my wife and I've, you know, we've been together for like 20 years. And when we were just dating, we met in Brooklyn. Um, and so we, we like moved from place to place to place, you know, we, for a while we were living, um, we had a, an amazing landlord and we had like a very small floor within her house and I kind of moved out of there and just kept kind of expanding. And then now we have two kids, so we have we needed more space. But yeah, we've been here for a while. We lucked out where we got a place in Greenpoint before Greenpoint um, became what Greenpoint is now. So we've, we, you know, didn't get priced out. But mm. yeah, it's uh, it's at a point now where like every time I leave my house, I'm like, oh, wow, there's like a different shop that's opened or like, oh, here's this very specific artisanal this or that that wasn't here. But I think too, you know, the block we live on, there's still a lot of the old timers. I have a neighbor who's 90, his name is Angelo. And I talk to him all the time. You know, he stands outside of his house on like, there's a little fence, he lives on the corner and he kind of updates me about things going on. And he's been in the same house for 50 years. So there's people like that who are just holding on. He actually used to be a vice cop in Times Square. So he has some really fascinating stories. So there, it still feels like a neighborhood. Like I, it hasn't been completely, there's no condos or anything like that, you know, which is nice. Well, I know like, where was it? It was a Manhattan Ave or Greenpoint Ave um, or both Ave. You know, down on, I think, Green or Manhattan Ave, they were building, like, starting to build all these, like, ridiculous condos again or apartments. Yeah. Well, I, I think at the time, you know, they were talking about uh, Amazon coming in, the HQ coming in that area, or Queens, and they yeah, started yeah, they building these mega structures, and it was like, who's going to live here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting, you know, like, there was, there was an amazing right aid a block from my house, a couple blocks from my house that had been made in an old like um, sort of a movie theater or like, I never knew it was a movie theater or a roller skater rink. I, I always forget what it used to be or like an opera house or something. It was beautiful, but then they just, it sold, they knocked it down they're building a condo there. So we yeah. do see that in the distance. But you know, my friend, um, Matthew Barney, who's an artist and I like do a series of events in Long Island City and the space where his warehouse is was gonna be knocked down for Amazon. And then Amazon backed out. So we, we had actually planned like a final event. We were going to like do something to the building, like not blow it up or anything, but we were like, oh, we could like find a way to kind of dig out the floor or just do something as a final event. And then Amazon, you know, changed their minds and didn't come. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Too much pushback from uh, the, that community, which is yeah. good. But then I think mm -hmm. they opened up, uh, I think a major office in Manhattan, but yeah, Manhattan, yeah they, so. they just like they just shifted that I mean, that's the way it is with i guess capitalism like it's always it's like whack-a-mole it's going to pop up somewhere you're not going to escape it but it's on the side of um matthew studio we put up this like sign counting down the days and hours left in trump's presidency and that became like a thing people were into as well and 
we were like, shit, if this place gets knocked down, this sign's going to go away too, you know? So it was like, that was, it was a twofold thing because we'd hear from people in the community that were like, really, that, that thing means a lot to us once we figured out what it is. Cause we didn't really explain it. It just kind of slowly got out into the world. Oh yeah. This is like this sign that was made. Um, you know, my wife, who I was talking about before we started recording is an architect and she designed that thing and we built it, but yeah, people, it, it meant something. I'm like, wow. So just a little detail like when a place like Amazon comes in, they knock down the buildings, but also like all the stories attached to it and like yeah. the visuals that someone gets when they're just walking through their neighborhood. So it was nice. Yeah, they kind of wipe out an entire um, ecosystem. So it's good that they went somewhere else, even though they then wiped up that ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. Well, we, we could go on just in the topic of gentrification, <laughs> et cetera. But yeah. just one more point on this, and then we'll get into more cultural dialogue and maybe yeah. a bit of uh, biographical initially and then sure spin off from there but uh you know that's the thing though it's like uh you know what they replace these unique venues and, and institution you know historic venues and, and buildings are just homogenous generic you know condos or apartments or high end high end uh mm -hmm. uh places that are just built with cheap materials you know so yeah. it's like yeah. That's the danger of this gentrification uh, in trends. I've seen a lot up here too in Beacon. It's, it's a lot of major developments, and, and nobody's going to live in there. They, you know, just the developers are just, you know, writing it off for taxes and building out their real estate portfolios. But it, it's uh, just generic looking, you know, cheap yeah. material based, templated kind of housing. And it's like, that's not what we need right now. We need to keep those like staples, the uh, historic neighborhood venues, the the bars, those, mm -hmm. those those locales with stories and history. Keep them open, you know. It's like, oh man, you know, I, it's a shame to see those go down just just to be replaced with generic buildings. Yeah, no, I agree. Do you know do you ever, that there's that woman um, that story of. Uh... Lady Winchester, I think, who kept building her house and kept adding to it because, you know, her husband had died or something. And she thought the place would be haunted if she stopped building. So she would start building like doorways into doorways and like hallways that went nowhere. And I think that's often what it feels like urban planning mm. in 2022. It's just like people, yeah, let's like, keep building stuff upon things that aren't needed. Yeah, like you're saying, cheaply made stuff, like all these condos that on the bottom have a rest, like a store that says like gourmet food, or you know, it's like that kind of thing. We're like, yeah, this is not gourmet. This is just depressing. And um, but yeah, it's it's it just keeps building up and up and up and up and up. So it is nice when you see the small things that don't go away. And there's still so many places in Greenpoint, like in my neighborhood, that are amazing. Like the guy that's like you know repair shoes, and he's his place is jam packed. There's no space left open in there it's just tons of shoes he's cool. fixing or like yeah. you know it's like all those kinds of spots that there's still plenty of those and some of those storefronts really you know, like 200 square feet or something like that they've managed to uh use space and you know my dad grew up in brooklyn and he's like very obsessed with the idea of space and how people can fit so much into something so small and now he lives in new jersey where there's more space but he's just always like look at all this wasted space like to him like in open areas like wasted <laughs> which yeah. is i guess uh, there's a different kind of thing like growing up in the city but we go into a bodega and he's like, look at that. Like there's nothing wasted in here. And it's like really satisfying to him that people are just like, but it's using what's already there instead of expanding upon what's there. It's like, no, let's use what's here. We don't need to add an addition. We can just like jam that into that part of the thing. So yeah, it's like a different mindset, I guess, but yeah. Hmm. Oh, actually, is that um, film Nora theater still there? It was like, it looks like kind of like a house kind oh, of. Yeah, yeah, that is still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's still I there. I love yeah. that place. It was so like, kind of just like uh, sketchy a bit, but it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's across from a tattoo shop. Yeah, like yeah, it's across yeah. from Greenpoint Tattoo. Yeah, that place is still there. And I think it's the same guy that runs it and he just cool. knows everything about film. And yeah, it's like, you're, yeah, to, to, for people who've never seen it, you're kind of like walking on just a street, a neighborhood street, and you turn the corner. And then on the corner, there's this film noir theater that will have like, um, put movie posters up for like, hey, here's the new like psychic TV movie or whatever documentary or like, here's this thing, here's this weird horror, like, you know, B horror film or it's, yeah, those places are what, yeah, or make it all incredible. And yeah, there's right across from that, right down the street from that, there's um, a grocery store that was like sold by the woman who owned it forever to a young chef. And now they make like this like 
amazing hummus and whatever they you know written up in the New Yorker, like all that kind of stuff. But it's just like these like interesting mixes of things going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I know we could talk about uh, Greenpoint and the you know and, uh, <laughs> gentrification and the cultural yeah. mix there, which I would love to. But I would also love to dive into just music culture. Sure. A bit about how you, you got to where you are now because you, you you're you have so much you have a deep breath of work you know a lot of public you know information about you and your stories out there regarding uh your, how you got from um but reminds people like you, know, you grew up in New Jersey was it or that rule yeah, yeah I grew up in, yeah yeah I grew up in the Pine Barrens so like um get my town I grew up in has you know, at the time I was growing up like 800 people. So like very small yeah. dirt road um, in the middle of the woods and just like kind of this small weird house that a previous owner had built. So nothing was right in it, you know, like my um, my mom who uh, has, has passed like before my first kid was born, but she was married a few times. And one of her husbands um, was, uh, you know, uh, heating and air conditioning installer. And he was like going through there trying to figure out how the place was built. And he's like, oh my God, this is just like the strangest, like, like things weren't square, things didn't add up, you know? And it's like, but it's a kind of town where it's small enough, you don't have to file any, any like, you know, any kind of permits to build. You just say, all right, cool, we're gonna build this in the middle of nowhere, no one's gonna see it. And it's like, you know, the closest thing to us was a, a biker bar called the Woodshed, which was like, we, if you cut through the, the woods behind my house for like three miles, you could get there. And it's like that kind of place. And so for me, I had a younger brother, or I have a younger brother named Todd. And like, we both, you know, I got into punk and into zines through a friend of mine named Moss, who I'm still friends with and who I've known since first grade. And it, we lucked out that he had an older sister who knew more than we did. So she like sort of introduced us to like Seven Seconds and Youth of Today and Minor Threat and all that kind of stuff. And so really like my only con it was before the internet obviously and like my content contact with the world was through zines so I started making zines and like my zine was called white bread it was about growing up in a white trash town like not fitting in like at the time I was vegetarian which mm. was like very shunned because you know my step various stepfathers were hunters and like you know it was just like it was not the place that you were vegetarian um and into politics and again like the town where I grew up in is now very firmly like a you know Trump kind of focused town. It's like it was so to be someone who is like, you know, liberal or like punk or whatever. So zines gave me like people to talk to, mm. gave me sort of a, an outside community. And it's yeah, we'd write these long letters back and forth and like share things and um really like make no money off of it. It was kind of like the beauty of youth when you're living at home and you can make something like that. And then I reached a point where I, when I did want to like actually like buy a stereo or something. Pardon me. Oh, may I ask if um yeah. how you get how you're pushing the those zines out like distributing? Sure, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of curious because yeah, <laughs> obviously it's different days. Those the uh, yeah, yeah, those days, yeah. I was mailing them out, but also um there was a thing where Tower Records at the time would like pick up zines and distribute them. Yeah. And I sent them a sample. You would mail them a sample, then they would write you back or. Yeah, they would write you back. They wouldn't call you. They would just like send a letter, you know, and then they would write you back and they were like, all right, we'll take like 200 of these. And then the next time they took 300, they just kind of would take more and more. And so I would make, yeah, I'd make like a thousand of these zines and they would be gone. And it was through that. It was through like, they'd get reviewed in Maxim Rock and Roll or like Fact Sheet 5 or some of these other kinds of zines like Jersey Beat, like a New Jersey zine, um, which is actually like the first place I ever wrote outside of like my own zine was Jersey Beat. And yeah, so it was through that and then people would trade as you start getting pen pals and or like if a friend's band was going on tour, you say, hey, can you take 10 of these zines with you and just like put them on the merch table or like when I was in bands, we would take them, put them in record stores, you know, on consignment, go to like Third Street Jazz in Philly or like the Philadelphia Record Exchange or like eventually in New Brunswick, you know, like go to, I used to work at Cheap Thrills and we'd sell them there, yeah. which is now like shut down. But yeah, so it was kind of, so it was very much like, you know, Everyone says DIY now, but it's very much like, yeah, just like doing the getting it out there yourself and kind of, for me, the big thing was the Tower Records thing felt like, all right, this is, it's the big time, you know? Yeah. And I remember there was like an art, they did a review in Alternative Press, which was like a, you know, a glossy or a magazine about white bread. And the same thing, I was like, all right, here we go. This is going to be like where the zine just takes off. And, but then I realized like my expectations for it were just to like get rid of those 
a thousand copies and to make friends and to kind of make connections in a very pure way. And it's like, yeah, so many of those people I met through that I'm still friends with. And this one guy, Bill, that I met through that, those times he lives in LA now, but we're still, you know, we still know each other. When I was going out to LA more before the pandemic to do, I was curating stuff at um, the Broad Museum, like music stuff. He and I would hang out. And it's like, we basically met because when I was 17, I put on a show in my dad's backyard on like this big plot of like farmland and made like a two day festival. And my dad somehow allowed me to do that, um, which now as a parent, I can't believe that he let me do it just because it was like so much liability, but he did. And this guy, Bill, who was living in Philly at the time, basically like called me because on the, the poster for the, the flyer for the event, I had my dad's phone number because I didn't have, a, there was like no cell phones. So it was just like, call this number for information. And people just call the home line and this guy, Bill called. He's like, hey, do you mind if I make copies of this flyer and like post it around? And then, yeah, we became friends and we're still friends. So I think it was very much just, a, it was the need to do it because I had time on my hands. I was living in the middle of nowhere. I was a child, but also it was the only way I could have a community outside of like, my brother is great, but you need more than, I needed more than just my brother is, yeah. you know, it was like, um, yeah. So that was how it started was doing that kind of stuff. Cool. Now that's, it's like, that would be so foreign today, it seems like. I mean, yeah, there's no, unfortunately. Oh, no. sorry, one sec. It's on the top shelf. <laughs> sorry, my wife was asking. So. Oh, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, uh, I've had that a few times where, <laughs> actually, you know, earlier uh, on in uh, the Zoom combos, I, you know, I was talking to Tom, um, uh, Tom I, I can never pronounce that, Tom Berenier. Barrier. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure people, and then matches pop in just you know <laughs> it was cool it was yeah. cool i was, I was, was trying to signal to jane off the i was going trying to signal to her off of the thing but she couldn't figure out what i was pointing at yeah it was our dog leash we she was trying to figure out where the dog leash was yeah it, it, it's not an issue but uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just, yeah yeah i was just kind of saying like um it, it's kind of like a foreign concept these days with the web where you would have to go to you know or you know just actually do it yourself and, and uh, try to make connections with like Tower Records and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Who, whom obviously aren't, they don't exist anymore either. Like, <laughs> yeah, nothing so, exists. Which yeah. is like Gen Zers, and, you know, they're like, what is a record store? You know? <laughs> but I think, you know, I think like Tom, Tom's a good example because I'm old friends with Matt. Yeah. So I know Tom through Matt. But I know Matt because when I lived in Buffalo, um, where I went to grad school, I put on a show with the National. And it turned out it was like their first show outside of New York, which at the time I didn't realize, but it was also, there was the internet, but it wasn't the way it is now. And so a lot of the way I tried to promote that show was like, I wrote an article in the local free weekly called um, Art Voice, which was like the Buffalo, like village voice kind of thing. And we made flyers. We really like pushed it and pushed it and like street teams, like me and my friends were like handed flyers out everywhere. And we ended up getting like 60 people to come. And we were like... <laughs> We thought that was like reasonable. Like, all right, 60 people, that's cool. And we did it at um, a place called Big Orbit Gallery, hmm. which um, I don't know if it exists anymore, but then like, because it was, you know, the band was still small at the time, they stayed with us um, for like a few days. And, you know, I became friends with all of them, but like, I'm mostly still friends with Matt and Aaron, but it's like, that was 20 something years ago. And it was a different time. And so seeing them kind of grow, in the way they did was satisfying because I know in those times they like they were really having to push it and really work it hard and like this I started a website called the creative independent and one of the first interviews I did was with Matt and one of his the conversation was about having patience and like sort of how things take time and mm. he also talked about in that interview about like um the embarrassment of like having a show and only your friends come like nobody else comes you know and just sort of the humility you learn and how you keep going and I remember once he and I were in like a bar in um, Manhattan and we were looking at the Village Voice and there was like a big Interpol article and there was like a tiny little like sidebar on the national. And he was like, man, we'll never be the band with like the full page article, you know, we're just going to always be like the guys with the sidebar. Um, and yeah, I and mean, you see like, obviously now they've, they've grown, but I think yeah, a lot of those relationships that happened early on, those things stick. And I think that kind of community is really important. And that's like something that I think is it still exists obviously but it's also harder to do when you're locked up because of covid and it's harder to do when everyone is just like focused um online all the time yeah. and so yeah 
you, I never want to be like the old guy who's like, things were better, but I don't think they were better. I think a lot of things are better now, but I do think it's important to remember like, yeah, to step away and to kind of make those kinds of, um, those kinds of connections that are like, I think that are, that feel pure to me. Like I was saying to Jane, my wife the other day, I love all these weird little interactions I have with people I don't really know. Um, but we, we like, you know, I go to the bodega, I talk to the bodega guy every day, you know, and like we have these little conversations and neither one of us expects anything from the other person. We mm -hmm. just like tell the same stupid joke and they're like, all right, see ya. And like, yeah, yeah, I love those kinds of things because they feel like there's nothing attached. And I think some of those friendships feel like that, like early on where it's like, hey, I'll put on a show for your band nobody's heard of. Neither one of us has anything to gain from this. And like, sure, sure we'll drive all the way to Buffalo to play this place for 60 people. And then you just kind of see, you kind of both keep going. And then suddenly your friend is like producing Taylor Swift records. And you're like, whoa, what the hell? This, is, this wasn't on the, the plan way back when, you know? So see, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool to see that stuff happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of like kind of flash forwarding to the present times, um, like what have you, you've uh, noticed these days that uh, trends that, uh, you know, post pandemic or in the uh, pandemic age, you've noticed um, musically and production wise and uh, community culture wise, have you, mm -hmm. seen, have you noticed anything that, you know, uh, we could take away, say like, if we, if like as historians, we can step back and say next, into 50 years or 100 years oh this this is like a movement that is specifically spurned from uh covid times you know um have yeah. you noticed any any unique patterns i guess if that's a yeah i think one thing i've noticed with like artists that i manage or musicians i manage is that not being able to tour for a little while actually was kind of beneficial because they were able to like work on um finishing music or like working on sync deals, like, you know, signing better production or like, you know, um, publishing contracts. Uh, and I think, you know, touring is really hard. And I think touring is great because you're out in the world and you're seeing people. But I think as touring happens again, a lot of people are like, oh crap, I forgot like how thankless this can be because budget, like in a budget wise, it's like, if you're not at a certain level, you're not going to make a huge amount of money touring, you know? And I think a lot of people romanticize that idea of touring because they missed it during COVID. But then as things have opened up again, they go, yeah, this is a struggle and this is hard and you have to do it right. You have to, so I think a lot of people learned different ways to tour and thought about live shows in a different way during COVID and kind of have come back and use that information to kind of be more specific, like maybe book shorter tours, like maybe just do like an East Coast run, then a West Coast run, make sure like it's attached to something that may be, you know, good like press, um, sort of uh, opportunities or a festival that pays more, do something with a gallery you like. And I think people have kind of learned to tour a little bit more leisurely and in a way that's less like black flag. You'd be like, yeah, we're gonna do like 400 shows across the US. Like people are kind of taking it easier. And I think someone who's really good with this is an artist I manage named War Mother. And she's like, she does the shows that she wants to do and that seem interesting to her. And mm -hmm. like, she's playing Carnegie Hall next week, which is, which is like insane, but it's like, and it's sold out and it's, her and Sun Ra Orchestra and Kelsey Liu. And it's like an Afrofuturism, part of an Afrofuturism festival. And she's, you know, very knowledgeable in that area. And it's interesting to her. So she'll do that, but she's not going to like come out and then do like five shows around it. She'll do like the one thing. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, there used to be a thing where people would think, well, I'm in that town. I should try to like do 75 other things and burn themselves out. And she's very good about like, I'm going here to do this thing. That's what I'm focused on. Then I'll go and do that thing. And yeah, I think people learn that they've learned how to tour um, in a smarter way and which allows them to like protect their health and protect their um, like both mentally and physically and also just to make more money in the end because at the end of the day the artist has to like earn something for all their work I think a lot of records got more ambitious I think because people had more time so they would maybe like dig deeper on production think about their music in a different way spend the time to kind of reflect on that I think that's changed a lot I do, I do think like, I think it's interesting, like the kind of music, if you make music that needs to be in a crowd, I, I've talked to a few people about that, how like they would think, well, maybe this record is not gonna be heard live for a long time. And that would change maybe the way they thought about how the song sounded, or like maybe this is something that'll be experienced most by people in a solitary you know, form or inside. But I think in many, in many weird ways, COVID changed a lot, but it all feels, 
not temporary, but it feels like a learning. It feels like learning can be taken from it. And I thought about this with like my, my one kid, Jake, who's eight. And I thought, man, COVID's been here for two years of that life, which is a huge chunk of his life. But as he gets older, it'll be like a less and a smaller and smaller percentage of his life. And I think that's how this will be. A lot of things happened. A lot of things affected people. But as we go on, you know, it's not like I talk to my dad and say, hey, dad, when you were a kid and you had to stay inside because of polio, how did that change you? You know, at this point, he's like, I barely remember. And this is kind of like, I think yeah. as we go on, hopefully that changes. And I think in a weird way, economically, it could have helped a lot of artists. It kind of got to re reevaluate how money was being made. And I think one thing I've been like very staunch about is like before the pandemic, the music industry sucked and it still sucks. So it's like, it wasn't like the, the music industry was this amazingly equitable thing where artists were getting all this money, then suddenly COVID screwed it up. It's like, no, they were always getting screwed. In that. And then it just became like people stopped and kind of thought about it more because they had more time to think about it. But like Spotify, all this other stuff, like this has always been the issue. But I think people, um, yeah, they, they, they were, got more vocal about it. So maybe that's been a really good thing to come out of it is people just being more vocal about politics in general. I think with yeah. like so many things happening over the last few years with like Black Lives Matter, um, you know, protests in general, um, people are less apt to just let something slide now. You know, like, no, this is actually wrong and I want to talk about it or I want to say something about it. And yeah, I think the same thing is happening with music where people used to just get into really bad deals with labels. Now people know better and they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't sign away this for, you know, in perpetuity for like $4,000 or something. So I think, yeah, people are just savvier now than hmm. they were, which I think that's, that's, great going forward like I think like friends of mine where they like people I know that are like maybe 10 years younger than me or 20 years younger than me like their knowledge base at like 15 is so much greater than mine was at 15 where I was kind of just like stumbling around sending out zines and trying to figure out the world where they're like oh yeah I was pitching Rolling Stone or I was like doing this I my first book proposal was sent out when I was like 17 or something and I'm like holy Jesus you know that was just like <laughs> not even on my radar. So like, people are just yeah getting more, they have more knowledge now and how to like arm themselves with like the tools to kind of make sure they're getting what they deserve. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, with the, the web, you have access to so much, like all the archives, you know, any mm -hmm. any library database is generally free or you, you know, you just have a library card with the New York pu Public Library online. It's amazing, yeah. you know, it's yeah. just a wealth of information, you know, and, uh, yeah, like uh, the younger generations are, just have all that information in the world readily accessible to them, even in the rural parts of uh, this nation, you know? And um, yeah. have you noticed that, like a uh, common underlying, like, uh, I, I guess, a uh, note of uh, expression, like through sound or lyrics, uh, has there been a commonality in angst or any, uh, you know, particularly against a, when we're in this uh, such a uh, turbulent uh, socio-political and geopolitical time right now. Do you I have some, yeah. artists that speak to that or? Yeah, I, mean, I think some do. It's interesting. Like I think some people create art that kind of reflects that time and other people kind of are making work that removes us from the time because I think each sides are about each thing is valid where in some cases you need like space from that kind of you know you need from like yeah. the onslaught of the world like I was talking to someone I managed earlier today about she's been working on like more like ambient like field recordings and stuff and that's very much like not that but it's also something people need and I think there's a reason why like on Spotify and these things like the chill playlists do so well because people are just like all right I need like I need to relax I need to just yeah. get out of this but I think you know people definitely have um, addressed it as well. And it's all different kinds of, of, of politics, like whether someone's like addressing their like identity as someone who's trans, whether it's someone who's like you know, a queer black woman, whether it's someone who's like um, has issues with capitalism. Like I think people are like expressing their things in different ways, but I also think people are digging deeper into history, you know, and like sort of like, this is my riff on the history of jazz. This is my thing about like, you know, the biography of a friend who died. This is like this. So I think people like are, the, the politics can be super personal and, and not small, but like local, or they could be like bigger and global. But I do think a lot of people may be focused more on like these smaller, like smaller personal reactions to politics where I think, yeah, like growing up, maybe someone like bad religion or something who's like a little more ham fisted about like, you know, we're going to like, you know, it's sort of like a much bigger, almost speaking in like, um, 
I don't want to say cliches, but like speaking in these like broader terms, like people got really personal, which is kind of a interesting to see and kind of addressing like solitude and maybe the lack of community and like claustrophobia from being indoors all the time, but expressing that in different ways where I think all these records could exist outside of COVID. But if you listen to them during COVID, you're like, oh yeah, I can see where this came from. Yeah. But I think like, yeah, like someone like Grouper always makes a Grouper record and her last, most recent record has those feelings, but all of her records did, you know? So it's kind of like, I think there's, there's a little bit of like people who are already doing that I think had more material to dig into. Like, I think some people like, you know, like a Bon Jovi or something who maybe like don't touch in that zone. Maybe they're like, this will be the record. We'll have a song that kind of like hints a little bit at like things people are going through. Like you're always going to get that, you know, like so, someone at that level who's like, we need to, we, we want to be like, no, no hate to Bon Jovi, you know, from New Jersey. So yeah, I love the man, but it's like, I think people like, yeah, they're, they're going to have different people reacting, but I think people just reacted honestly to it. I think people made really honest music and if they're honest, honesty brought them to like politics that's great if it brought them to like reckoning with their own like personal issues that's great um but i think i tend to also just listen to music that's kind of like darker and more depressing so i feel like the music i listen to is going to touch on that even like the greatest of boom times you know like yeah it's funny my friend and i were talking the other day how um the super bowl is this weekend and our friend mick who's a guitarist who is in the band kralis and like other he's like kind of really like amazing guitarist he has a show and it's like the same time as the super bowl and i was like it's i just love that there's these like different realities like there's a super bowl happening then there's like mick gonna be shredding guitar stuff somewhere and it's like yeah there's always these different things going on and people will kind of like seek out the things that they want to seek out and maybe some people will watch half the super bowl and half of mix set you know and it's like yeah i think there's always levels of things happening yeah anytime well that brings me a good uh a, a kind of question i was gonna had just uh, in mind as well, like how does uh, with the, the flood of information and just, uh, you know, of music and, you know, art and uh, everybody has, has the, the, the means to distribute um, said uh, chosen expression, mm -hmm. uh, how does one stand out as an artist uh, with everybody trying to create something, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, I think it's like, one of the one of the people I manage released her record on like a very small label. It's like two people at the label. One of them is someone that I've known since I was a teenager. And it's a great label, but it's a small label. And her record is like one of the most successful albums this past year. It's her name is Cassandra Jenkins, and the record's like an overview of phenomenal nature. And she released that thing. She initially intended for it to just be like a free thing on Bandcamp. A friend of hers was like, you should probably put that on a label. So she put it out and it's like in its 12th pressing now, you know, it's been like a huge success, but it didn't have like any kind of secret industry backing or like any kind of inside track in that way. It was just like really good music. And so people and a good story around it and she did good interviews and it, it just really worked. But I think that's an example of where it just comes down to like making really good work really does help. And I think for me, that was, has been satisfying because people often have this idea like, oh, this is just doing well because like they know somebody or like this is, um, yeah, the label paid payola or whatever, you know, like when I used to work at Pitchfork, people would always would say that. And I was like, there's no payola. Like we all, we all work in a warehouse and like, we don't yeah. make a lot of money. And it was like, yeah. I think people had that idea that like we were like people in Pitchfork were like bathing in golden bathtubs and like, you know, driving limousines. I'm like, yeah, we're just like a bunch of people that like music and like we're doing our thing, but it's like, yeah. So for her to have that success is a good example of just like good art, good music stuck. And what she was doing didn't sound like what other people were doing either. So it stood out in that way. Like it didn't sound like it was trying to capture or hit onto some kind of like trend. And like one thing, when I talk to people at the Creative Independent that comes up a lot is like making the work you, you care about and believe in and thinking about the work first versus mm -hmm. where it goes. And like this person that was interviewed recently, who's a writer was saying, for him, the most important thing is just like making the work, getting it published to secondary. And then it's sort of like, isn't yours anymore in some ways, because it goes out to the world, but you kind of have to believe in the thing you're making. And I think you can't be, it can't be like a cynical thing where you're like, all right, what is what do people like based on the algorithm? I'm gonna make this exact thing and then it's gonna succeed. Or like, I'm gonna write this book that takes parts of this and this and this. Now Frankenstein together, like, a surefire um, recipe. I think that really 
optimistically and maybe idealistically, like the things that are just really good and, and that people really believe in and um, can stand behind, I think do well. And like one thing I have, I've, I think about all the time is like, I get up really early. Like I get up at five to write every morning hmm. and it's because I get up before my kids get up. And sometimes the stuff I write turns into a book. Sometimes it's just like whatever. Sometimes I'm just doing email, but it's always something. Yeah. Um, but I like, I don't have anyone telling me to do it. I just get up and do it, you know? And so I'm not, it's not like someone's like saying, Hey, dude, do your thing. I'm, it's just, I like to do it. Like for yeah. me, it's enjoyable. And I worked so many like jobs in my life that I hated from like the age 13 onward that I also feel lucky to get to do stuff I actually like. So for me, it's like, cool, I'm up, gonna have some coffee and do this thing. And I'm doing it regardless of whether um, anyone else sees it, you know, it's just like, cause I enjoy doing it. I think that's the important thing is, and of course there's always like, there is always the, the band that's created in a studio by like a record label and they do well, or there's like the person who does copy a formula and it succeeds. And like, that's, yeah, that does happen. But I think for your like, average person that wants to just make stuff it's like you have to work harder like my friend john who designs like body armor for the military but is also a photographer and also a trainer he was like saying yeah you have to be like the person that works the hardest if you're not like naturally like the best at something and i think that's true it's just kind of like slow and steady of just like working and working and working Hmm. like not everyone is picasso or like um whatever you know wittgenstein like people just have to like yeah, a lot of people just have to work hard, and that's how you succeed. And it's sort of, I like I, I remember when I used to work at Pitchfork intern. Like I talked to like an intern, and they would say, you know, how did you become an editor here? Like what happened? And I would be like, well, there's really no clear path. Like I worked in a gas station. When I was at the gas station, it was a graveyard shift. Nobody was there, so I read a lot. Then I like listened to a lot of music, started writing about music. It's just like you know, there's like the path is always different, but there's yeah. no like surefire way. But I think the only commonality is that it always just takes hard work, basically. And uh, uh, just a curiosity in whatever subject you're really, it has to be honest, curiosity and a passion for it too. And and just really open to exploring that uh, process and learning the history of, you know, the chosen medium as well. And and just incorporate and trying to incorporate your own unique process within that structured, formalized process built off of others from the yeah. past um, totally yeah 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 i thought of something this the other day where someone was saying yeah they're like i listened to this and this and this when i made this record but it doesn't sound like that and i was like yeah but it's because you, it's what you listen to to get you in the mood to make the thing you wanted to make you know so it's like yeah. if i'm going to read like you know when i was a kid i loved james joyce because i just thought this is cool like this is such weird writing i'm going to read this but i never wrote like that i just thought it kind of but it got me in the mood to do what i wanted to do or it inspired me and i thought wow this person made this stuff people are into it and it was like especially when you're reading it without studying it in school you have no idea what the hell is going on but you're still just kind of like something about this is interesting to me and i'm gonna i'm gonna explore it more like reading andy warhol's diaries and then looking in the back at all the different people that were cited i'm like oh who's this the velvet underground like then i'm like you know that's how i figured out the Velvet underground so you just sort of like you found stuff out in these really backwards ways or like i found out about raymond carver from reading like sonic youth liner notes you know and i'm like Hmm, they thank Raymond Carver. Who's that? And then I go to the library. Oh, it's a short story writer. You know, and it's like, I think, yeah, just having that curiosity, like you're saying, and sort of searching stuff out and not all of that adds up to like, suddenly I'm making music like Sonic Youth or like writing like Raymond Carver, but it's just like things that inspire you to want to do something and like make something on your own. And, mm. um, yeah. And like, and also not be afraid of failing it. Like, you know, this book that I just finished is called how to, F- how to fail successfully. Hmm. and it's comes out in like june and the big part of it is like everything everyone fails you know we all have like missteps we all like make something that nobody likes or like they like it for the wrong reasons or whatever but it's like like yeah just keep going and it never gets easier for anyone you know you could be like someone who's written a book and it's a bestseller then you're like now i gotta write a second book you know and it's like it's just never gonna get easy and i remember like early on when the creative independent first started i interviewed philip glass and, but he wanted to do it at his house and you know he's like 80 something and i'm there and he's like all right time to end the interview i gotta go practice and like every day he practices and i thought yeah of course like the dude's in his 80s he's a huge success and even with him you know he drove a taxi till he was 40 or something you know or 44 before he became a professional musician or one that was like making money off his work hmm. um but yeah i think it's just all about working hard and like staying passionate and curious 
and you can't really like just suddenly like rest on your laurels. I mean, you can, but then it's like, that's to me, that's not interesting. Like I always liked, um, I don't know, my first job was picking blueberries and you only got paid by how many pounds you picked. And so if you stopped working, you didn't get paid. And I've always kind of carried that with me where I'm like, yeah, I want to like earn what I'm getting, hmm. what I'm doing. I don't want to be the guy that just like shows up to work and is just like updating my Facebook page all day. Like I want to actually show up and, and do something. Yeah. Yeah. That it's, uh, Sorry, I, I, was, I was just digesting. <laughs> Sorry, I've had a lot of coffee today, so I'm just, I'm just laying it down. Yeah, no, no, no it's good. It's good. I just uh, like to digest the information a bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's, but I, I guess there always comes a point too with um, where, it, it, particularly in the creative path, it's never easy, you know, yeah. obviously. But then it's like, you know, if, if people, don't even like see any traction regarding like say monetary traction even a little bit not i'm not talking yeah. major rarity success but uh right making even like uh, a basic income off it so uh, is there a point where somebody should say oh, i'm just making art for myself comparatively to uh art for you know kind of uh trying to make a living from it and maybe i should just kind of uh table that and maybe pursue something else or are you just intrinsically an artist uh, and uh, you just got to continuously create uh, right. because I, yeah. I i found you know just like i found my my calling later you know like uh, and I've, I've been discovering all these processes like all these funnel processes to get funding and etc and i'm like no i don't like that process you know i'm right. just yeah, like yeah. gonna do my own thing i like doing my own thing as a more of like an entrepreneurial spirit, but right. there's obvious been times recently where like, why do I do this? Or like, why should I continue when I don't see the monetary effects immediately, right. but I have like all the external, like, you know, kind of feedback from positive press and, uh, you know, views on this and et cetera. I'm like, well, monetary wise, it's like, yeah, not, not so much right now, but right. I mean, yeah. The universe is kind of leading me this way after years of just being in different industries and not really connecting well. And this is like, yes, this is it. You know, art and community discussions about art is my thing. But right. uh, I guess what I think it takes time, you know? points, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think, too, you know, it's like there is um, an interview on, on the Craven Independent at one point where someone was like, your, you know, artists, the artists you love might not all make the money you think they make, you know, or like um, the people you think are successful are successful, but they might not be like successful monetarily. And many people have day jobs that you don't know about. And it's like years and years ago, I worked at Stereo Gum and I did a column called Quit Your Day Job, or it was called Don't Quit Your Day Job. And it was about people who like had a day job while also making music because Stereo Gum focuses on music. So it'd be like, yeah, that guy from used to have a thing called girl talk back in the day it was like dj stuff and he was also like a biochemist or something it's like these kinds of things so like someone else who worked here on the on the weekends or like worked part-time and i think often yeah i mean we're like when i was a teenager i thought if i can write for the village voice i'll be like a success and then i wrote for the village voice they barely paid anything and it took like five months to get paid and i was like all right that wasn't what i thought it would be so then i was like all right i'll do this then and you kind of like keep my, my goals kept shifting. Mm. Um, but you know, like when I graduated college, I moved to Canada for a while and I was like working, yeah, working the graveyard shift at a gas station. And it was, I enjoyed it. It was like, I always grew up in, a, in like a working class environment and like a small town and farming community. And for me, it was like, there was space to read, there was space to do stuff, but I didn't want to do that forever. Like I did it, you know, for a year. Then I mm. lucked out, got a job at an art gallery and slowly did stuff there. But I think it took a long time to actually make any money off of the work itself. But for me, it was just stuff I found time to do. Like it was the stuff I was excited to do. So even like when I was working at the, at the gas station, I also worked at like a um, greenhouse. So I'd come home, sleep for a while, get up and like work on writing, then go to the greenhouse. And it was like, I always found time for that. So it was like, and that was years and years away of actually ever making money off of it, but it kind of kept doing it. But I do think even if no one pays for what you're doing or like, um, sees what you're doing you're still an artist you know and i think you're if you still want to make the stuff it's not based on like how much money you make off of it or like um how many people read it or how many likes you get or how many because you know, if that were the case it would be like influencers would be the artists you know and yeah. it's like so then it would be like the weird person who's like 
you know, in the park, getting the, the perfect shot over and over again of doing the same yoga pose, like that's the artist then, you know, cause they're the ones who are getting the most views and everything. Yeah. But I think, yeah. I think you're just driven to do it. And I, I, I feel like I know so many people, I know this guy named Ron Combe. Hmm. He was like a downtown New York writer for years was working at the strand still. And then a different bookstore and was like one of the most influential people within like that community of like keeping writers connected and making work. And he has like two, two sons, like one is an artist one makes makes music kind of like a like a lightning bolt kind of project i think like that kind of vibe and he always had a day job and he but in my mind i was like this guy's like you know iconic he's like an amazing person and he is an amazing person but he also is making the kind of writing that people enjoy but he's not going to get rich doing it but yeah. he's an important writer or like you know so many people that are like that so i think if you're just driven to do it you keep doing it and then maybe now then you get like that weird thing where someone you know does a soundtrack and, and then they buy a house or something or like, you know, someone like sells the thing. You're like, whoa. But I think so many people would keep doing it anyway. And then yeah. some people won't. And I think that's also like, there's no, no shame in that. I feel like, you know what, screw it. I've written my like 30th play. No one's performed it. I'm just going to go like get a job at this place. I think that's fine too. But I think often that stuff never goes away. So even if you do work somewhere else, you come home and find the way to kind of like do the other thing you care about, you know? And I yeah. think that's, yeah, I mean, like, my, I feel like my facts are not entirely right here, but, you know, like with someone like Kafka or something who always kind of worked and never published anything until after he died. And yeah, it's like, he's obviously an amazing writer, but it wasn't like he was posting his stuff up on uh, Twitter at night and like getting, you know, retweets and stuff. He was just kind of doing it because he cared about doing it without yeah. anybody even seeing it. Yeah, well, that, that, that brings me to an important point too. Um, when is the, the point where you're like, uh, an artist should show their work if they because you know it's like you know you could have a massive you know breadth of work that's just in your studio and then it, it, uh you know you could pass away and then it's discovered after but i feel like it should be shown like work should be shown in an open form yeah. um no matter yeah. what form but is there like a decision points or, or is it just up to like this is, I'm this work is finished and I am ready to show it kind of decision process within the artisans um yeah uh, I think it depends thought. on the artist yeah yeah I think it depends on the artist and I think some people like to share stuff before it's done get like feedback on it I think one of the reasons why I enjoy doing the management stuff with musicians is because you get to be part of that process like they'll share something before it's done you're like give your two cents and like they can take it or leave it, but it's just interesting to give the feedback and to, like you were saying before, how like when you found what you wanted to do and now like, you're like, cool, this is my path. And I think like when I was younger, when I was in bands, I realized I'm not a very good musician. Like I'm like competent, like you like tell me what to play and I'll play it. But my strength was more in like figuring out the artwork, booking the shows, like coming up with titles, the concepts and I was like oh wait this is like what I'm better at it's like that part of it and so then that's like kind of what I gravitated towards or like I had a friend Ben who was like just a very honest guy and he's like you know you're like a much better writer than you are a musician maybe you should focus on the writing and I was like hmm. so I think like there is sometimes it just takes like figuring out the thing you're good at or not good at and like yeah I remember when I first met my wife Jane we were dating I was trying to write a novel and it was terrible and it was just like I was really slogging at it and I was really trying so hard and I kind of didn't realize the thing that I was good at was the thing that came easy, which was just like writing shorter, like more personal stuff, like kind of like the book stuff I've been doing. But in my mind, it was like, no, no, it can't be the stuff I did in, in my zine. Like, that's just too easy. I got to like, try to write the great American novel. And I just like sucked at that. And I think sometimes it's realizing you're not going to show anyone the thing because it's terrible <laughs> because you're not doing the right thing. You know, then like you suddenly find like, oh, wait, actually, I'm good at this. And I think like too, my friend, Melissa um, Broder, who does the, the Twitter account so sad today. Um, she was, you know, has been a poet and a writer for years. And I feel like it was her Twitter that really finally like brought her visibility, but that led to her writing like novels that are on like the New York Times bestseller and all list wow. and stuff. But it was like through her Twitter account. And you think as a poet, you're probably not, that's probably not your plan. Like, oh, cool. My Twitter is going to go viral, but it happened. And I think so for everyone, it's different. And so much of it is luck and just weird things happen at the right time. Like even with the Crave Independent, the way that started was I mentioned to a friend I was leaving Pitchfork and then we started brainstorming it and it kind of came together randomly because I was like in a coffee shop and I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave Pitchfork. And so, yeah, I, I often thought about that. Like, what if I wasn't asked that question? Like, what are you doing next at the right moment? Maybe I wouldn't have done it, you know? So mm -hmm. I think 
but yeah, as far as when to share, I think it's, it's always different. Some people never want to share what they do and that's fine. I think some people, um, want to share all the time and like, and maybe it's like every day, it's like, Hey, check out my new demo. And it's like a little bit too much, but I think there's like, yeah, there's spaces in between and everyone's different. And I think it just comes back to this idea that if you want to make stuff and you're drawn to do it, it's going to be something you keep doing and you keep finding ways to do it. And you, it's a thing you make time to do, you know, where it's like, whenever people are like, yeah, I just didn't have time. Then it's like, no, you had time. You just told me you like watched 25 Netflix shows. And like, yeah, yeah. you know, I've seen you like tweeting 4,800 times today. You had time. You just didn't make the time. And it's like this interview on the Creative Independent with Henry Rollins of all people, where he's like, he's like the guy that is, he says, I never had time to write the book. He's like, you had the time. It's just a matter of like the day that you're sitting on the couch and it's raining outside. And you're like, yeah, I don't want to go running. He's like, the second you get off the couch and go run, you're going to be glad you did it. And it's just a matter of getting off the couch, you know, and that's yeah. like, that's what it takes, which Actually, can be a pain. <laughs> it's funny you say the, the couch uh, kind of metaphor where I my like fourth interview or maybe third interview as interviewing uh, Ron English, uh, the, the pop yeah. surrealist painter at his yeah. house in Beacon. He's like, hey, the enemy of the artist is the couch, you know, and it's, you know, his process, hey, he's crazy. He's saying that uh, he paints for 12 hours a day, you know, 12 oh. hours. Well, I mean, but that's, that is, <laughs> yeah, at, yeah. The, at this stage, he, he has the, uh, you know, the, the money coming in and the business, and yeah, he, yeah. it's a full-time profession, of course, so 12 right. hours a day in his studio, you know, downstairs, and it's just like, oh, man, you're, that's, that's prolific, man. <laughs> I, I, was, I was in the park this morning with um, two friends, like, just extra, doing art, like, you know, running and exercising, trying to stay healthy. And one of them is an artist and he was saying he'd removed his couch from his studio because that way he's like, he goes in as all, all that's in there is stuff he can work on, you know, yeah. so he has like no distractions. And that's, that's come up in TCI interviews too, where like someone is like, hey, I'm working on a book. When I do that, I make my husband take my phone and like we remove them, like the, in, the modem from our house or whatever, you know, so I can all, if I'm on my computer, all I can do is write. I can't yeah. like Google things and stuff. I think that's the thing too, is like people, everyone wastes time and everyone has moments where they're like, all right, I'm doing my thing. And suddenly they're on like a, a worm, you know, like on YouTube looking at like videos of like whatever bands they liked from 20 years ago or something. But that happens to everyone. And I think some people have the idea like, yeah, no, this person's an artist. They just never waste time. They're always just like focused and they're always successful. And I think that's the beauty of like being slow and steady. If you have a day that sucks, you're like, all right, well, I'm going to do it again tomorrow. So like yeah. maybe that'll be better. And if it's not, okay, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And then yeah, eventually you get it right, then it's eventually you finish something, but it's not like a quick fix. Well, I find like days like that, like where you're like kind of just hit a wall on, on the project or idea. It's like those are our days where you, when you just maybe even take a, a leisurely walk or just like not even think about the project, then that's when things start flowing again. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just have a lazy, like not like lazy on the couch, but like not thinking about how to solve a, a problem with your project or, you know, or it just, just let your mind wander, you know? And um, yeah, that's, that's why I like to run. Like I run all the time because yeah, even like while you're, we're talking now, like someone is, um, <laughs> someone's texting me and it's coming with my phone. I'm just thinking like those kinds of things where it's like bing, bing. But when I run, yeah, I just put on music on my headphones and I just kind of go for it. It's like the one time of the day where I'm removed from any of that, and it's important. And that's where often my like best ideas come from. Like ideas, even if not the best, at least ideas that I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to try to pursue that. Or like, that's an interesting thing that I just thought of. Or like, yeah, like is those moments where I'm completely removed because now there is just so many ways for people to contact you or like things that can cloud your mind. Or like, I think one thing I think about, I said to my kids before is like, when I was a kid, I read a lot. They read a lot too. And I made zines and stuff, but it wasn't because I was like somehow you know, super smart or something. It's just like, there's nothing else to do. And like now they can like be online all day. They can do this. And there's so many distractions. And like my friend, Mark Richardson, who was at Pitchfork for years too, we both said that once. We're like, yeah, we, we did so much when we were kids. Not because we were better. It's like, we had nothing else to do. We're just like, all right, cool. Now I'm a gazillion. What else am I going to do? I have all day. I have like two TV channels. I don't have a phone, you know, like I don't have a cell phone. All right, cool. I'll just create something. And so I think for people growing up now, there's, there's like much higher level of distraction to get past before they can actually just like sit down to do the thing. So even though there's like more tools and more knowledge available, they're also battling against this like constant 
in flux. Like so many people I see walking who are just on their phones, you know, and walking dogs and like, you know, on their phone and not looking at the dog. And I was thinking, yeah, when I was a kid, my parents had a dog, they would just walk the dog, you know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, so it's harder now, I think, to find the space. And throughout all your interviews on uh, the Creative Independent, have you found a commonality within the, uh, no matter what artistic medium, like throughout the process, ha is there a commonality with each, uh, if you've noticed or even reflected back on, like if you did an overview kind of? Yeah. Uh, is there a commonality uh, when talking about process with uh, these artisans that you've noticed uh, about yeah. continuing? Yeah. I think a lot of people talk about like momentum, you know, and how they'll do a lot of different things. It's interesting. Last week I was doing a podcast thing and the person who came to record it was like, clearly like she, she knew how to do podcast, like how to do production, but she mm -hmm. also was like, Hey, I'm doing comedy and I'm doing this. And she was doing a bunch of different things. And I was thinking a lot of people that we interview on the site do a lot of different things. Like they might be like a writer, but they also have another project on the side, or they might be like a filmmaker, but they also work on this. And I think, one thing that I, th I think has come up a lot is people like the idea of momentum where it's like, if you're burnt out on one thing, you go to the next thing. And that my friend John, I was mentioning like the, the guy that makes the body armor and stuff like he was there this morning too. And like the one thing he always talks about is like, if you're like, like lifting weights or something, if you come to a full stop, it's harder to go. Mm. But if you keep kind of this like fluid movement, you can keep going. And I think people talk about that often with projects like, all right, this thing is not working, but I'll go that way. Or like this thing is not working so like i'll take a walk and then do that thing it's kind of like staying moving in some way even if it's not and not moving in the sense of like working all the time but just like finding a rhythm and i think a lot of people talk about that i think a lot of people talk about the trouble of like making time to do the stuff they want to do comes up a lot um finding the money to do the stuff they want to do comes up a lot like you know often as your ideas grow like the money needed to make the things also grows and sometimes like your ambition doesn't quite scale with like the economic resources available to you. So you're like, that happens a lot. People talk about like, yeah, like creative blocks about um, failure, like how they view failure, how they view success, how like their ideas of success change as they do more, you know, as they get older. And that's been interesting is like interviewing someone who's like 80 versus someone who's like 22 or something and you know, just seeing how like ideas of process change as someone gets older and how they view what they do. I remember like, when I interviewed Ryushi Sakamoto, he released a record first in like eight years because he had uh, throat cancer. Mm. And I was like, I asked him something about the record, if it was hard to make a record or why it took so long or like how was it hard to release this record after eight years or something? He's like, well, the only hard thing was I thought, well, maybe it could be my last record, you know, because it's like mortality was, he was viewing mortality. I think that's much different than someone who's like, I took eight years to do it because, you know, like, um, the, you know, like Axel Rose taking 20 years to make Chinese democracy. It's like a different thing, you know, for him. Yeah. Yeah. He was dealing with like cancer treatment and all these other things. And he makes this record. He's like, well, this could be the last thing I ever make, you know? So, mm. and, you know, he's still alive and, you know, but uh, yeah, I think like all that stuff is interesting. Like the humanness. And I think the fact that it never gets easy, like no one, no one we've interviewed has ever been like, oh yeah, it's a breeze. I did the one thing and now I'm just like smooth sailing. Like it's always like, it's always a challenge. Yeah. Like no one is, solved it you know even like the most um like confident person like i think rollins comes back always is like the real confident guy like i remember when i interviewed him i was like all right cool i think we got it all he's like let me tell you something else and he just kind of kept going you know which i appreciated yeah but even him he's like yeah it's hard and he has to like set things up for himself and like he falls asleep at his desk and like he's like talking about all these issues that he faces when making work and it's but you have to just like as he says, like, you have to realize it's hard and just kind of like, all right, I got to embrace the fact that it's difficult and just like make it happen. So I think all that stuff comes up, that it is a challenge, but you do it because you want to do it. And mm. yeah, it never gets easy. Um, yeah. yeah I, I guess, is there a way uh, our contemporary society and now late capitalism uh, can, re I, we, we all know the importance of culture and art and in and, and expression to a society but we've seen programs get cut from yeah. public education from you know nonprofits from you know we know art and creativity and expression is very important um but we've seen trends recently where arts have been cut from due to certain political uh people persons in <laughs> office and uh, yeah. we just seen that trend of late capitalism and kind of 
neo autocratic kind of globalism now like we've seen with Russia and China uh, but yeah. uh, is there a way to I don't know where I was going sorry I just that went off topic oh, well, <laughs> no, you I, make valid points though yeah I well I was gonna wrap into the like how do we as a society are, like highlight the importance of arts education and funding and yeah and uh and, and keep those really important programs going because you know i talked to the a few weeks ago the founder of a uh, blue bear music school out in san francisco mm -hmm. and you know they're a non-profit um uh, music school since uh, rock and uh, traditionally started for rock and roll back in the 70s and uh you know, uh, you know, all these programs had to stop due to, you know, COVID, like educational programs for youth. And, and, and then, you know, young people in the, like urban settings, like don't have anything to do with yeah. COVID. It's like, how do we, you know, you know, continue these important programs when the, in this hostile kind of environment to the arts, but we also then yeah. also reward high art too. So it's like, right clashing forces we know yeah, it's tricky yeah you know I, it, yeah it's just a question i guess but. yeah i think it's like um i mean my, my kids sorry i'm getting like my uh, my kids both go to public school you know and like one thing i'll say is um i give my wife a lot of credit like she's you know an architect runs her own thing is super busy um and she joined the pta to kind of like figure out ways to raise money for the art side of things you know and so we would do like fundraisers we do like art options we would do shows at like union pool in um brooklyn like during the day like, like yeah. on the afternoons we'd get like friends bands to play you know like like surfing with feet played and halado negro and like they dorian and like just get all these people to come in and do their thing um and that's like one short-term thing where you're just like cool because you have parents who like like organizing things and want to organize stuff and want to try to like make those things accessible to people and available to people but then it's sort of like once those people leave you have to make sure you're handing it off to someone else so i think it comes back to that community side of things but again that's like putting it all into like the hands of the, the people in the school mm. and if those people suppose you go to hand it off and suddenly everyone's like yeah no like this is like we're too we're too burnt out um and that happens you know you get burnt out and like that kind of community thing can only you know it's essential but you can't expect people to do it forever and like once our kids you know our one kid has gone from that school now the other one's still there but during COVID it shifted um and we've tried to like continue helping where we can but you can't really do live events anymore like just like it sort of limits the ways you can raise money um so yeah. then you have to create different ways to do it but no, I agree it's like we live in like a very it's like things are like to go back to where we started like the gentrification and all that and like people knocking down beautiful stuff to put up like things that'll be flooded out in a couple of years because they're built so terribly or like people I you know I talked I spoke to someone the other day who moved into a spot where like all the light sockets were put in upside down or something because like people were just like rushing to get it done you know so it's like yeah. that's always going to be the case and, like people are like we have to make this as fast as possible so we can start collecting rent as fast as possible um yeah it's like a hard thing to figure out I always feel like I try to position my life in a way where I'm trying to help as many people as I can. And like, if a kid like direct messages me and asks for advice, I'll try to help them. If like an artist I don't manage needs help, I'll try to help if I can. I've had people reach out and they're like, can you manage me? And I'm, I don't have time, but I'll find you a manager. I think like if we each did that, if we each tried to like help where we could, it would eventually like, we'd be helping a lot of people, hmm. but it's hard to change the actual system that's around us. You know, that's like the tricky thing is like, some of it is just like, offering the assistance you can, but we're not, it's like, yeah, we can't like individually like shift the way banks work or like yeah, the way the yeah. government's funding things. Like those things take more time. But I do think if we shift, it's like, sounds very like hippie-ish, but if you shift the vibe and like one thing I've, I was always, I once said to um, Jane, I was like, yeah, if people just weren't assholes. It'd be a lot better, you know? And it's like, sounds like so basic, but it's really true. Like if people were just kind of like, well, no, I'd, I'd prefer to see you succeed and fail. Like, I'm happy to like help you. I, we want to have success together, like remove competition in like a way of like, I'm going to one up you like, like sort of chill out on ego. Like all these things would be so much better, but it's like hard. Yeah, it's, it's impossible and hard, but I feel like, yeah, we can just chip away at it the best we can and like figure out, you know, maybe the things that we're contributing help in some way, even if they're not solving things or at least like 
making our time on the planet better yeah. <laughs> or yeah. like more tolerable, you know? So it's like, yeah, I think like that's, that's like the idea I would think is just like, yeah, to make things as, as yeah, as, as uh, tolerable as we can and as like joyful as we can. And like this guy, Zach Fox, who was on the interview on TCI the other day, he was like, yeah, he's trying to find like joy in the boring stuff. And I think that's important. It's just like finding um, joy in the small stuff too. Yeah. Well, some good news, though. I recently, well, actually, I've learned um, New York State is going to have uh, UB, uh, UBI for like 2,700 artists. You know, they're starting yeah. that program or application process cool. late, yeah. later this month, which is great, right? Like, it is great, yeah. If you had set income for artists to focus on their art, that I, I feel like that that's great, you know? But that's yeah, 2,700. You know, I, you <laughs> yeah. know, in New York, yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, that's another yeah. like lottery system, you know, but yeah, that, that's, I, you know, I've seen that out in, you know, different countries in Europe too, that tested that out and it's, yeah, it, it, it's a great system, but you know, the, 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 the people will get, it's gonna, it's gonna be like, it just a kind of craps you to get there, you know, or to get that one application, you know, that, that. Who knows? But that, yeah, I, I think everything's a start, you know. I yeah, think that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, like everything's a start, and it's like as long as it's started, and it's kind of that same idea of like momentum and movement. Like as long as things are happening, like maybe it'll lead to something else. Like one yeah. thing leads to the next thing, and then next thing is better than the last thing. And I always, I always try to be optimistic about this stuff because I like found for me personally that like the pessimistic thing doesn't work so much, you know. And it's like I have plenty of friends who are pessimistic, and you know, if, you know, yeah, it's it's like. For me, I'm like, okay. I think like, you know, one thing that really shifted the way I think a lot was like when my mother died and she died of pancreatic cancer that like, came very fast. It was like, just like this quick thing, you know? And it's sort of like, I went back to Chatsworth where she still lived and like, like the crappy house I was talking about early on and um, was there with her when she died. And suddenly I was like, oh, wow, this is, well, I mean, it was terrible. It was also like, so this is the stuff she cared about at the end. She wanted to like, see me feed her chickens, like see her horses. Um, she had like, you know, two horses, uh, walk around the property, like around the, the, the trees. And like, she sent me to the grocery store and like get one of each kind of fruit, just all these like really basic things. So I was like, this is the stuff that matters at the end. And it's like, so if you can like lead up to that point and like try to give other people some kind of happiness while they're still, while they're around, hmm. that to me like felt like the important thing to do. And like not like maximizing profit or like uh, taking a shortcut to rip somebody off or like competing with somebody. It's just like I was already pretty mellow as a person, but somehow it just like like shifted something really specifically. Or I was like, all right, this is like what I want to spend my time doing. Um, and yeah, so everything's a start and everything is like optimistic, but it's it just takes like you got to kind of keep going. And so it's sort of like even when I'm you know old and grayer, and it's kind of like in the end times, I'm sure I'll be like, shit, there's still so much I wanted to do, but I'd prefer to like leave it all at like to do as much as I possibly can before that point, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Two more point uh, questions yeah. real quick. Um, regarding uh, Basilica Soundscape, I, I imagine with COVID you had to kind of put that off uh, up in Hudson yeah. or- Yeah, we put it, yeah. It was like, it was too complicated and so much yeah. of that event is being present you know and um we didn't want to do a stream thing we did a very small version of it actually that we called the silica sound bath but we barely promoted it because we only sold like 150 tickets and kept it really small and we yeah. had you know robert a, a. Lowe, who he likens who did the candy man soundtrack he he did and who like he and i go back a very long time and actually he and his wife Rose and I are like working on a book together about crying right now, like crying in public and stuff. Oh, cool. um, she's the illustrator. Hmm. He performed and Circuit Does You performed who I manage. Um, and a, a guy named Samir performed to like play these massive gongs. And we just did like a really continuous sound bath for like two hours and that was it. But oh. we're going to bring it back this coming year. Like Melissa, who I started it with and she runs the space, owns the space um, up there and lives in Hudson. Um, yeah, she and I were talking about it the other day, and we're going to do it in 2022, later cool. in the year, like next fall. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Looking forward to that. And yeah. what uh, what do you listen to these days in contemporary music, I guess? What, yeah. what are you listening to now? I feel like my listening has gotten really um, pragmatic, or like, pretty, like, you know, like there's a new Tomberlin record. I manage her, so I've been listening to her record and like figuring out 
videos, like ideas for videos, or like what the next single will be, or like I manage hand habits and Meg has like a bunch of side projects. And one of them is like this beautiful instrumental um, guitar project. So I've been listening to that, you know, mm -hmm. just really thinking about like labels that would make sense for. So I kind of listen in that way, like, mm -hmm, like, you know, that's, uh, but when I run, I listen to Deaf Heaven because <laughs> I feel like that's like good. And I listen to Explosions in the Sky when I run. Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes I listen to Destroyer, which makes no sense when I run, but I kind of like listening. It's almost like the way some people listen to podcasts when they run. I listen huh. to like Dan Behar's lyrics and I think that's works. Um, then I'll listen to like, you know, just someone will point out a label to me or something I'm like, oh, this is a cool, there's a label called like, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but it's like O-R-I-N-D-A-L, Orindal. Um, and they put out like a lot of interesting like ambient stuff, but also, yeah, like they put out that artist Gia Margaret, who I think is interesting, does cool stuff. Um, sometimes if someone reaches out about management, I'll just listen to their stuff for a while and like, you know, just sort of like, oh, cool. And then it sends you down a wormhole into other areas. Yeah. But yeah. And then my, my kids, you know, they, they just blast pop radio all the time. So it's, I know a lot about um, um, the current pop scene, you know, the top 40 scene, which I think is cool. Like they listen to that, but they also listen to a lot of other things that are less so. They don't really differentiate. They're just like, whether they're listening to like, you know, Selena Gomez or like uh, Bollywood music or um, some weird like punk thing, you know, like yeah. Misfits or something. It's just to them, they're like, oh yeah, it's just like, it's all on the same line. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I listen to a variety of things. And I think it just depends on the day and like what I'm trying to do that day. Um, but yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I, I guess that's it, uh, Brandon. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for I, having I, me. Yeah, I don't want to keep you uh, too much longer. Uh, did you have a uh, a date on the your next uh, version of, of Stay Inspired? I, I forget the yeah. title. I'm sorry, I got no, lost no, no, in no, conversation. It's, it's, it's called um, "You Had to Fail Successfully." I think it's out like June 23rd or something like that. Oh, cool. So, sometime in June, yeah. Definitely looking forward to it. Uh, I enjoyed thanks. your Stay Inspired book. No, I'm Thanks never so good at pulling uh, worksheets and in, in, in actual like. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I read through, like, skipped yeah. all that. that, that that's how I would have done it too, honestly. I just read through it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. I was like, I, I put like placers. I'll, I'll go back to that. Never did. But <laughs> yeah, that's I fine. Yeah, I think that's yeah. the concept of the book, but I never went back to do <laughs> yeah, like, homework. Uses, yeah, as, as long as you're like, yeah, everyone uses it in different ways. But yeah, I do the same thing. Like, yeah, I think it's, yeah, everyone it's like there as a tool and then you can use it. And some people have sent me like, hey, I filled all this stuff out or this or that. But it's like, it does remind me of like homework that my kids often have, you know, or I'm like, yeah. that's probably was part of what came to mind when I came, sort of started doing it that way. But yeah, I think the failure book too, you'll see there's like way more contributors in the other books, like because so many people had so much to say about failure. So it's, yeah. it's it was cool to see different people's thoughts on it. And you realize, yeah, like, like I was saying, nobody was like, oh, me, I've never failed. You know, like if you reach that, if someone says that, you should just like remove yourselves from them. Like, immediately. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally true. But yeah, it's like Trump or something, you know, like Trump would think he never failed. That's like that kind of mindset. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh totally. <laughs> that's just yeah. delusion right there. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. But uh, <laughs> totally looking forward to that, that book yeah. and uh, diving deeper into creative independence. And um, yeah. definitely looking forward to maybe to fall for uh, the festival. We'll have to go up to Hudson. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, come on uh, through. Yeah, man. But uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Me. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, yeah man. And, sorry uh, for the texting. It was, yeah, my wife was texting me some questions, but. <laughs> well, that, I'm so used to that now. Like people just popping yeah. in and like even like spouses popping in with laundry baskets and stuff like yeah, that yeah, yeah yeah but these are the zoom sessions so yeah yeah, yeah. i appreciate it. it's a good it's a good aesthetic it's very honest yeah yeah, yeah. so um <laughs> oh have a wonderful afternoon sir yeah you and too definitely, yeah, yeah. Uh, be on the lookout for more stuff and definitely awesome. um, do a deeper dive into your uh writings and uh your artist on, on your, your uh, Zone 6 uh, yeah, roster. Yeah. Cool. yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I'll, I'm sure we'll email soon. Cool. Yeah, of course. Talk to you later. Take care, Bye. sir. See Bye. you.